Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to GGS 300 Quantitative Methods for Spatial Science. Today we're going to be going over lecture 13 and we're going to be focusing on correlation. So I put the assignment work up on Blackboard now for this week and that assignment is going to be due on April the 29th so I think that should be fairly straightforward for you now given that you've completed uh, something like 10 assignments so far so do reach out to me if you have any further questions or any uh, issues which you want to raise regarding the work. I think we're pretty much at the end of the class now. So we've only got two weeks, so this week we'll be covering correlation and uh, I'll be covering this uh, entirely within this lecture, but then the laboratory will be covering both correlation and a couple of just tests which were introduced during the categorical um, categorical test uh, week pr previously, so last week. Uh, and the reason for that obviously is that last week we had the midterm, so we didn't actually have a laboratory session, so there's just one or two small tests put in towards the end there. And when you complete that assignment, uh, the assignment this week will include both correlation and categorical difference tests, just to make sure that you, uh, you're you fully covered on those, those two different aspects. And then once we've done that, <laughs> uh, you'll be very excited to know that we just have a final week to complete, and that's on regression, which is a fantastic, uh, fantastic tool. It really is a bedrock for a lot of the work that I've done. Um, so this is going to be one of the main um, statistical techniques that you might use in the future, and very much builds off the work that we're going to be covering this week, uh, focusing on correlations. Okay. So that's two more assignments, and then plus the final exam, and that, that final exam is going to essentially be cumulative, so it will just cover everything that uh, we've been over throughout the course uh, to ensure that you know you have that very, very good breadth of all of those statistical topics which we've been covering over the past uh, 12, 13 weeks. Okay. Let's get into correlation. So uh, as you know, we started off focusing more on descriptive stats and now we've done quite a bit of work. In fact, m the most amount of work this term on inferential stats. So I think we did three or four weeks for the first part and then we've been focusing now for uh, at least six or seven weeks on, uh, on the inferential statistics side, which is arguably the most important part. But, uh, you know, without that firm start over in this descriptive statistics, phase you won't have that information that kind of understanding to progress to those more advanced tests and here we are we're on the flow chart that i've used a couple of times just to kind of direct where we we could be uh, based on different types of data that we may want to analyze so we've uh, we've been all over this now so we've covered the discrete and categorical data last week with chi-squared tests um, we've covered a whole range of difference tests, okay, so based on means, so depending on the number of treatment groups that we have, whether that's two groups or two or more groups, or many, many, many groups, um, then, then we've covered a whole range of parametric and non-parametric tests for those situations. Where we haven't really been so far yet is actually kind of focusing on the relationships among data variables and what that actually means in terms of formalizing those relationships and testing uh, our understanding of, uh, of those um, similarities between data variables. So today we'll be focusing for parametric tests on Pearson's R correlation coefficient. So don't be intimidated by that. We'll cover that shortly. And then the non-parametric version of that, which is Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. Okay. The nature of the correlation. So, as I kind of explained before, so far we've been focusing more on um, uh, actually comparing samples that we've collected to understand uh, parameters which may relate to the population, for example. Uh, and they've been kind of focusing on differences between means, for example. Now what we're kind of moving on to is actually trying to understand more about similarities between different uh, data variables and whether we actually have uh, relationships which exist, which may help us understand a phenomenon of interest that we want to, uh, to gain more information on so that we can uh, you know, develop a policy, uh, make better business decisions, uh, generally make the world a better place, hopefully. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, within this uh, correlation analysis uh, sphere, we are able to understand both the direction of that association. So don't worry, we'll get into this shortly. This is whether it's a positive correlation or a negative correlation. And then we'll be able to actually quantify and understand the relevance of that direction. So what's the strength of that association between those two variables? Is it, is it strongly positive? Is it negatively? Uh, is it strongly negative? Uh, is it only a very weak uh, 
uh, correlation, uh, so association between these two variables, or is there just no relationship at all? In which case, you know, that's still a very important finding. <laughs> every every finding is an important finding, and uh, finding no results is as important as finding a, a, a result in your in your work. So you need to just be very cognizant of that. One good thing here is that variables do not need to have the same units. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, what uh, those different factors are measured in, we're just trying to understand whether there's some sort of relationship between those different variables that we're interested in. I think that this is such a nice way to start to understand an area that you've just moved into. So I have this kind of very strong recollection of a senior postdoc who was uh, in my faculty at Cambridge when I was just starting out on my PhD. And he said, you know, when you first move into an area, and you don't know the actual kind of topic or you don't understand much of the area, the first thing that you need to do to understand a particular problem that you're working on is you need to get data for all of those different things that you th might think might influence the output variable. And you basically need to create scatter plots to understand how an increase or a decrease in this one key factor may lead to some sort of change or outcome in that main factor which you're interested in. And that person was very advanced. I mean, he had a whole host of quantitative methods under his belt that he could use. And he was saying, you know, this is the way that you want to start understanding a particular problem that you're working on if you don't understand the key mechanisms for what drives that. So if you don't maybe have that much existing theory or it's just generally a new area. And he was coming from physics. So, um, you know, this is, these are people who are strongly, strongly quantitative. So I really want to place an emphasis that out of all of the things that I want you to take away from this particular term, what we're basically doing in the last two weeks on correlation and regression are pretty much the key tools that I want you to take away so that if you have to go off and investigate something in the future relating to your job, then you'll know where to start, how to really start to understand quantitatively um, uh, the factors which feed into a problem which you're, you're trying to tackle. So... I mentioned before we, that that's how you kind of start approaching this topic. So start with visual inspection of the data. OK, so you want to plot these different factors against each other in order to understand their direction and their strength. So the direction could be positive. Or, so plus one is the most uh, strongly uh, positive correlation you could possibly have or negative. Uh, so the inverse of that negative one being the, the strongest negative correlation that you could have and then neutral so just being random basically so no no effective association so that would be zero um, and we've got examples over here of what a positive correlation looks like what a negative correlation looks like and, and what a neutral correlation looks like and really the way to think about that is that if i was to increase the x-axis here by one unit in this factor in this case it would lead to approximately a one unit increase in the factor on the y-axis okay so that's how you would end up with uh, this relationship which is which is strongly positive here uh, the reciprocal or the the, 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 the the alternative for that in the negative case is that if you were to increase the x-axis by one you would get a decrease on the y-axis perhaps by something similar like one and that's how you would end up with a negative outcome like this and then neutral is just randomly uh, allocated data points and no direct relationship between these two factors that, uh, that we can see from this data at least. So starting with visual inspection of data, great, yes, we're looking for uh, the, the, the strength of that relationship. So here's a good example of perfect association. So this would be a, a, a plus one for the, uh, the level of, of correlation between these two variables. This is a reasonably strong association here. This is quite weak because data points are quite far apart. So obviously the difference here is that it's negatively correlated, whereas these are positively correlated. And because they're spread out, it's indicative of the fact that the association may not necessarily be that strong. So it's weak. And then here we've just got a random uh, distribution of, of data points. OK, and I've already mentioned to you that these correlations take place between zero sorry, minus one and plus one, <laughs> with zero implying no correlation, okay? Great.
So the association between those variables can be many different things. So actually here, what we're going to be focusing more on is just linear association, uh, particularly because what we'll be covering in this term is just linear regression. So we won't actually be kind of advancing to those more uh, complicated, uh, kind of more advanced techniques, which might uh, utilize nonlinear methods. So that's just not something that we need to worry about here. Just focusing purely on linear trends, uh, which is great because it's a very nice, easy way to kind of understand the world Lots of people like doing this type of linear analysis. It's, it's just very easy to understand. OK. So the key issue that I need to raise here <laughs> is that correlation does not imply causation. OK, so some of you may have heard of this already. And what that basically means is we're pretty much always looking for kind of causal relationships when we go off and we try to understand the world. So um, we may want to try and understand um, what the factors are that are driving uh, real estate costs in, in Fairfax. OK, and we might go off and might plot a whole load of uh, data variables um, and look at scatter plots. But, but ultimately, what we're looking at there is just how correlated some of those factors are together. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, just because they're positively associated or negatively associated, there's some sort of relationship there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually a causal relationship, OK? And um, I mean, the internet is is <laughs> full of uh, jokes around this old adage that, that that's frequently uh, brought up. But I mean, it's a key point that you're going to be tested on in the exam. It's a key point that you need to take away from this statistics class, OK? Uh, and I've just thrown a couple of examples in here for you just to kind of get a flavour for what I mean by that. So. Just over here, what we have is a time series of uh, the murder rate in the US, which thankfully is decreasing, uh, and uh, the Microsoft Internet Explorer market share. OK, and you can see actually they're really quite similarly correlated. But obviously, in reality, there's absolutely no relationship between the two whatsoever. OK, um, and uh, yeah, there are literally books written on jokes around these types of graphs. OK, for very sad people like myself. Um, I just put the funny one down here as well. So these are people who have drowned after falling out of a fishing boat and the marriage rate in Kentucky. And you can see they're reasonably, actually, they're pretty strongly correlated together over this time series. Um, but obviously, they have absolutely no relationship to, <laughs> to each other whatsoever. So you just need to remember that because uh, you're kind of seeing this uh, this correlation, this relationship within the scatter plots, which maybe we've put together, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's actually a, a causal relationship there. So a uh, leading to B. Um, so we just need to be aware that uh, this is kind of adds to, to the complexity of uh, this type of quantitative analysis, OK? So pairs of spatial variables may also be associated to each other. But uh, generally, when we talk about correlation not implying causation, it's, it's really that there's like other variables, unexplained variables, so third variables, which are directly related to what we're measuring. Um, but we aren't actually driving the correlation in what we see, OK? And so this, uh, there could actually be multiple variables uh, across your data set rather than just one. And this leads to this problem, which uh, we'll cover next week, called multicollinearity. So, uh, you, you know, this is uh, getting into the realm of all of those issues around uh, the kind of independence of the data as well. So uh, we'll get into this at a later stage. One of my favourite examples is this geographic example of, of correlation not implying causation. So on the left hand side here, we have uh, those uh, counties which voted for the UK to leave the European Union in the 2016 uh, Brexit debate. Uh, so you can see the people, the areas voting to leave in blue and the areas in, in yellow voting to remain. And if you actually compare this map with the areas in 1992, which had mad cow disease. So this is uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So this was a, um, a neurodegenerative disease that was basically uh, affecting cattle and was generally found in quite low quality. Uh, quite cheap uh, types of meat and could actually pass to humans and could be very serious. 
But if you actually look at the two maps, I mean, they're pretty much identical uh, between the two. Uh, and obviously, these aren't related in any way. I mean, they're just a funny comparison. But uh, uh, obviously, there are other variables which are affecting these outcomes. And I mean, my conjecture here is that actually it's socioeconomic, right? So uh, what's actually happening is you have uh, areas voting mainly to remain in their areas which are generally uh, doing very well for themselves. So in London, the southeast, mainly around these areas here, uh, people doing very well out of uh, the UK's membership of the European Union, areas in blue, not, not, not so, and this will all be correlated with income. And actually, if you look on the right hand side here, it's the same kind of factor. It's, it's because you have those income disparities, uh, it meant that people were basically, by those like a majority of people in each of these areas, like purchasing um, uh, food products of different quality standards. And that's why you would end up with uh, this type of uh, map where some areas would have a high, pre prevalent, a high prevalence of uh, mad cow disease and some areas would not. So, you know, this is a really nice example. Of how you can have these completely two unrelated factors, um, but often they're being driven by things like socioeconomic income, which is just uh, such a key driver for many of the processes that we end up uh, studying within our subject area, particularly within spatial science. OK, so let's get into some math now. You know, that was just kind of the qualitative, theoretical, high level stuff. Whereas now what, what I'm really focusing on is uh, how we actually calculate some of these metrics. And uh, here I'm just presenting you with the, the formulae and we'll actually go over within the laboratory session how we do this, um, both using a couple of lines of nifty code and then also just using the inbuilt functions that we have within R, which allow us to do this very quickly. So once you know how to, to do these analyses, you know how they work. In the future, you can just basically use one line, one liners, and those one lines of code will just generate all the results for you very simply, and then you'll have a good understanding for how to interpret these results. So parametric correlation relates to the statistical concept of covariance, and we've got some good examples over here. So high positive covariance, uh, highly negative covariance, and then low covariation over here between these uh, these two factors in uh, on the x and the y axis. Okay. Uh, so really what we're interested in is the degree to which different variables are actually varying together or not, as the case may be, and we're actually able to quantitatively measure this. So to get the covariation for x and y, as we get here on the left-hand side, basically what we need to do is take the deviation of x from its mean and the deviation of y from its mean. So we're just subtracting for each data point the mean from each other data point, okay? And then we're summing them together once we've multiplied them. So we're basically just getting the, the, the deviations, which have been kind of the building block of those other tests that we've already used. So standard deviations, standardized scores, for example. So it's not particularly complicated for us to get this covariation metric. And uh, we're able to then use that within other tests, which we're going to get to within this session today. So let's move on to correlations tests, particularly those two which I mentioned before, so the parametric Pearson's correlation coefficient and the non-parametric Spearman's correlation rank correlation coefficient. So Pearson's correlation coefficient basically assesses the parametric correlation, as I've already said. There's multiple different ways for us to actually calculate it, so we're going to try and focus on the, the, the most simple approaches here. So when they usually say correlation, which people often do when they're throwing that term around, they really mean Pearson's R, R correlation coefficient, which we're going to find just here. Okay, So this correlation coefficient for both x and y, we're also going to need the standard deviation for x and y and the number of paired data values that we've got. And then this is actually, so the R is the sample correlation coefficient. Okay, And what we want to do is we want to get this R here. And to do that, we need to take the covariation for x and y, which we just calculated in the previous slide. So it's very simple. It's just a simple one line summation of those deviations. And then essentially, we need to divide it by the number of data pairs that we've got, and that gets us our numerator. And then we just need to divide it by um, so the, uh, the, the, the outcome of uh, the standard deviation of x multiplied by the standard deviation of y. OK, so we do need to do a bit more math to grind out uh, that, that particular outcome. But I mean, this isn't a complicated equation, so this should be fairly straightforward for us now. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, you can calculate it without using the covariation, uh, just like this here, if you want to do it from scratch. 
but uh, sequentially this is kind of how we've been building up to it over the last couple of slides but it's not particularly complicated so I have this kind of standard template that follows the book for us to describe each test so that you, when you leave here, have this um, compendium of different tests and it states their objectives, uh, the assumptions that are required to use that test, the certain hypotheses that you might use, and then the test statistics. So I just want to run through that here so we know where we sit with Pearson's correlation analysis. So the objective here is to uh, quantitatively determine if there's an association which exists between these two variables. But we do have a set of assumptions that we need to meet in order for us to actually use uh, the parametric tests which we're presenting here. So we need to have randomly sampled paired variables. We need to have variables that have a linear association. So I've mentioned this already today that we're focusing on uh, linear relationships between the factors that we want to assess. As this is parametric, uh, what we're actually focusing on here is continuous data, so we'd expect that we had ratio, interval-based sample observations. Um, so obviously if you had uh, ordinal data, for example, then this wouldn't be an appropriate test and you'd be better off, you'd have to use the Spearman's rank correlation approach that we'll get to in a couple of slides' time. And the two variables that we have have to have a bivariate normal distribution, okay? so. What exactly are the hypotheses that uh, we're expecting for these two different metrics? Um, so, so essentially what we're saying is in the null case that there is no correlation. Okay, So this is the business uh, as usual, the standard approach. We're assuming that there's no correlation between these two different metrics. And then in contrast to that, uh, for the actual alternative hypothesis, um, sorry, so this is rho, by the way, which is the population parameter for this correlation coefficient. So before, when we were using R, this is the sample correlation coefficient, and rho is the population um, uh, correlation coefficient. So the sample correlation coefficient is the best estimate of the population correlation coefficient. So that's why we're dealing with rho here. So sorry, just to recap then, the null hypothesis here is assuming no relationship, whereas in contrast, the alternative hypothesis is assuming that uh, the, uh, the, the, the correlation coefficient that we get is not equal to zero. So you'll remember that zero is uh, indicative of there being no relationship, okay? So if it was plus one, it would be a strong, very strong positive association. If it was close to negative one, then there would be a very strong negative association. But zero would just be no relationship, so no, um, no, no correlation in either direction between these two metrics. Okay, so that's why we have this row value relating to uh, the, the value zero. And uh, here we obviously have a bidirectional um, uh, 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 hypothesis and we're not stating a direction for um, uh, the, the different part of the distribution that we may expect this value to be in, uh, whereas we are actually able to, if we wanted to, um, state hy hy uh, hypotheses which are alternate, which have directions. Okay, so we could say that um, uh, the p-value, sorry, um, that, the, that we think there's a positive correlation, so this rho value here is above zero, it's going to be positive. Well, we could say that we expect there to be a negative correlation. Okay, so this rho value here is below zero. Uh, somewhere between uh, zero and uh, minus one, uh, indicative of the fact that we expect there to be some sort of uh, negative association. Okay, so that's the hypotheses. Uh, the test statistic, here we're focusing on using uh, the t-test statistic, and uh, we need to work out how to calculate that. So for example, down here, what we have is a way for us to actually get that t-test statistic, and we're going to go over that within uh, the laboratory session, so how we actually calculate that manually. And uh, obviously for each one of these uh, one of these sessions that you're, you're, you're covering, you should be reading the chapter along with it. So this is chapter 16 and they have a very nice example here <laughs> where you can actually look at the, um, sorry, so this is page 244 and it's the example uh, which is uh, it's figure 16.4 and uh, table 16.1, which provides you with a nice worked example for calculating the Pearson correlation coefficient for calculating the, for, for looking at the strength of relationship between the last uh, spring frost and latitude in the southeastern areas of the, of the United States.
Okay, so that's uh, a good example for you to look at. I was actually just laughing to myself recently about this because last year when I presented this, it was just uh, an example within my piece of work. But, uh, you know, I needed to replace some uh, grass on my lawn and uh, the best time to do that is uh, in the spring before it gets hot and uh, after the last uh, frost so that the seed doesn't die. Uh, and uh, yeah, I really needed this for my own life, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, great. Let's move on. So that's for parametric uh, tests, a parametric based approach. So when you're able to meet all of those often quite stringent assumptions about, uh, you know, normality, um, data being continuously um, uh, of a continuous type. Um, and then if, if you aren't able to meet those assumptions, then you need to start to look at those other options that you have. And in this case, if you're interested in correlation, then you're going to be needing to use Spearman's rank. So uh, as ever in statistics, <laughs> when it's named like this, it's because Spearman was the person who came up with the statistical approach. So it's named after that person. And uh, this is a particularly good approach if you've got monotonic relationships. OK, so if, if you're if you if it's a relationship that is either non-increasing or non-decreasing, um, uh, so we're able to actually convert the rank data that we have to to make it linear, essentially which is why it's kind of handy to, uh, to, to use this when we have non-normally distributed data. So the way to do that is that we need to get this RS value here. So this is the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. And to do that, we need to first get the sum of the squared difference in ranks. So you'll remember that from some of our previous statistical tests, we've focused on converting that data into rank data. So you should be reasonably familiar with how we do this now. Um, what we need to do is, uh, is calculate the number of paired data variables, sorry, paired data values, and then the difference in ranks that I just mentioned previously for variable X and for Y for each of those paired data values, okay? So then when we've got that, we can just go 6 multiplied by the sum of the squared difference in the ranks, um, which is uh, the, the numerator here. We then need to take the number of paired data values cubed minus the number of paired data values to get the denominator, and then we can subtract that from 1 in order to get this uh, RS, so this uh, Spearman's rank correlation coefficient value, OK? So... What do we need to do in order to meet the uh, particular assumptions for this approach? So uh, the objective first is for us to determine if there is a correlation between these two non-parametric variables. Um, the requirements are that we obviously have randomly sampled data and that those variables are paired. Obviously, we need ordinal observations, so either that uh, we've collected that data and it is ordinal from the start, or that we've had that interval or ratio based continuous data and it's not met our assumptions from the previous parametric test and as a result we've downgraded it and that means that we basically put it into uh, nominal categories which have some sort of order ranking hence it's ordinal data and uh, we would uh, expect for this test for there to be two paired variables for x and y and for them to have a monotonic relationship Okay, so the hypothesis is that in the null case, we wouldn't expect any relationship between these two variables, okay? So this row value as a consequence um, would basically end up being equal to zero. So um, that's, uh, that uh, there's no kind of key quantitative relationship between these, these variables. And then the, the flip side of that is obviously the alternative hypothesis, the bidirectional version, which is that uh, we assume that it's, it's not equal to zero and that there is uh, a correlation relationship between these two variables, okay? And that could either be positive or it could be negative unless we go to the extent whereby we actually specify our alternative hypothesis and a direction for that. So saying that this row S value is going to be larger than zero, so we think there's a positive correlation, or that this row S value is going to be lower than zero and therefore negative correlation, okay? Then we're going to use uh, a test statistic, which is z, so we're using the z distribution. And uh, basically here what we need to do is we need to take the rs value that we've got. We get the z rs by basically multiplying it by the square root of the number of degrees of freedom, okay, for the sample. So that wasn't particularly complicated, <laughs> and uh, hopefully that was uh, reasonably okay for you. Obviously, within the lab today, we're going to be covering a, a couple of those tests, which we didn't get a chance to pick up. 
from last week. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow that. You've got some of the math here. Make sure you do read chapter 16 within the book and uh, go over what I'm going to give you in the laboratory now and make sure you complete that assessment. And then hopefully you'll be just one step closer to completing this module uh, this term. And do reach out to me if you've got any further questions. But uh, it was great to see you again. So thanks for tuning in and uh, I'll see you in the laboratory. Thank you. Goodbye.